my colleague and uh, friend, the Honorable Communications Advisor to the Prime Minister, Mr. Pankaj Pichore, Mr. Chandradeep Banerjee, the Secretary General of the Confederation of Indian Industry, Mr. Uday Shankar, Mr. Ronnie Skruwala, Mr. Ahmed Khanna, ladies and gentlemen. It uh, definitely wasn't my intention to talk politics today in the morning, but uh, I think a couple of things which Uday Shankar alluded to do definitely require a response. And let me start by saying that uh, Uday perhaps maybe may have been a little right and maybe a little wrong when he said that uh, an accident brought about the economic liberalization process in 1991. The fact remains that uh, the process of opening up India's economy did not really commence in 1991, it actually commenced in 1985. But what happened between 1989 and 1991 was a series of cataclysmic events which uh, transformed the entire global landscape. You had the collapse of the Soviet Union, the demise of erstwhile East Europe, and then you had extremely eminent strategic thinkers like Francis Fukuyama saying that this is the end of history and then capitalism triumphed and it uh, held the field from 1991 till about 2004 and in India also those were the years when the compact on economic liberalization went across uh, the different governments uh, which came and went uh, one after the other between 1991 and 2004. But then in 2004, when people stepped back, paused, and started to think, they realized that there had been economic growth, there had been uh, close to uh, double-digit growth in certain economies, but in many contexts around the world, the growth, unfortunately, was not accompanied by the kind of social gain and this kind of social inclusion which was required. And that's why uh, in many countries which had rejected all forms of uh, even uh, or all pale shades of red also started voting social democratic governments back with a vengeance. And that's why in 2004 certain people felt that uh, India was shining Unfortunately, it was shimmering, or rather it was simmering. And that's why in the past nine years, an attempt has been made to include those who unfortunately had been left out of the growth story by possibly putting into place the most ambitious rights-based architecture which any country in the world could have possibly conceived, conceptualized, and implemented, starting with the right to information, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, the compulsory education for children, food security, tribal rights, and then, of course, the latest initi uh, initiative at land acquisition. All these were an attempt to ensure that the fruits of development actually trickle down to the last man in the last row. And this never came at the cost of growth. Because if you look uh, at 2004 to 2012 in a perspective, and I think these are figures which were released by the Reserve Bank of India only last week or possibly earlier this week, we clocked 8.1% in terms of growth. And this was at a point in time when economies around the world when financial institutions which had histories and legacies going back centuries were tumbling like nine pins. So therefore, I think before we decide to become the prophets of gloom and doom, uh, there is a need to look at the 
uh, growth story in a larger perspective and to try and uh, appreciate what has been achieved uh, in the context it, in which it has been done, which also enabled, which also meant surmounting perhaps the most difficult uh, economic uh, crisis which the world has confronted uh, since 1930, which was the economic meltdown, the ADL-driven uh, crisis of 2008, 2009, and 2010. The second point which my colleague uh, and dear friend Mr. Uday Shankar made was with regard to freedom of speech and expression. The philosophy of the UPA government over the past eight years is that our relationship with the media has been an essay in persuasion. It has not been an essay in regulation. As someone who was, uh, at a certain point in time, uh, a witness in my earlier capacity and a participant as a lawyer, uh, to try and save uh, a media company which had incurred the wrath of the government and uh, was being driven into the ground, I realized as to how fragile media freedoms are. And that is why we ensured in the past eight years and the uh, Honorable Prime Minister and the Chairperson of the United Progressive Alliance share this vision that our entire approach towards the media sector has to be an extremely soft touch approach and we have walked that talk over the past nine years and I think we are uh, possibly uh, reasonably uh, if not satisfied but do deserve an E for, e for an effort you know, for what uh, we've attempted to do. But having said that, uh, my own experience as a lawyer makes me conclude that uh, while the freedom of speech and expression should be unfettered, uh, but the reasonable restrictions which were rightly put in place by the founding fathers of the Indian Constitution is something that we need to uh, very seriously introspect about. In addition to the fact that uh, the restrictions which are imposed under 19.2 uh, operate in a totally different field from 191G and the caveats which are imposed on it by 196. So these are uh, two uh, entirely separate areas. Of course, the Constitution and the fundamental rights have to be read in conjunction. But I guess when we talk about uh, freedom of speech and expression, uh, we do need to factor these little nuances in.